All right, these are my top seven books of 2019. I put out this uh, list on my blog before the year ended, um, but I haven't gotten around to doing a video or a audio podcast version of it till now. Um, but we'll start out with number seven, which is Joy at the End of the Tether by Doug Wilson. Ecclesiastes is one of my favorite books uh, of the Bible, and Pastor Wilson does a really good job of bringing out the, the treasures of that book. Uh, this is from, from the book, The cycles ordained by God for everything in this fallen and silly world will come around again, and many a millionaire will go white in disbelief. How could this happen? Friend, look at the world. How could it not? So Doug just has this penchant um, for kind of uh, absorbing the world and, and coming to the same kind of uh, conclusions as, as the Koalef. I think a lot of people who are deep thinkers um, and, and just kind of see the vanity of the world, things being replaced uh, and taken over by others and um, injustices happening and, and all these things. You can get jaded and cynical, but uh, um, there's more to life than um, under the sun, that, that there does exist a final judgment um, and there does exist uh, a God above the sun who is orchestrating all of these things. And Doug, being a Calvinist, a uh, really hardcore, strident Calvinist, is able to kind of, I think, have an eye towards the, the glory of that aspect of God's sovereignty. Um, I'm just going to read a couple of, uh, this is a passage from chapter 5, which which really kind of reinforces that, that sovereignty of God idea. We buck when we hear these things because we are proud. We say that we do not want God's holiness impugned, but really we do not want our autonomy restricted. If God decrees all things, then I cannot escape, escape him, not even by plunging myself into all depravity. A man who embraces evil simply finds himself a tool in the hand of the Almighty. A man who rejects evil and follows wisdom finds himself a son in the family of the Almighty. The one option not offered to us is that of thwarting and restricting the purpose of God. So that's, I just think it's, that's, that's really good. Um, he goes on in another chapter, maybe it's the same chapter. A man must remember the coming judgment. Repeated success in sinning does not set aside the reality of ultimate justice. While injustice can seem uh, triumph, seem to triumph, sometimes good men lose and wicked men win. This apparent triumph is also vanity. He who has, an, he, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. To whom this gift of God has been given, let him enjoy it. The conclusion of the matter... What should a man do in the world of powerful kings and wicked men who look as though they got away with it? He should prepare to make merry. He should enjoy himself. He should eat, drink, and be merry all his days under the sun. Again, Solomon comes to an unexpected conclusion. The fact that men wield power, sometimes unrighteously, is occasion to make merry and enjoy life with anyone else who has been given the gift of this wisdom. And I think, so this book is really a good, um, it's a good corrective. It's a good antidote to, I think there's a lot of really pious Christians who may have good intentions, but they'll often manipulate you or that they're trying to, they're trying to impugn guilt on you for having joy, um, for having laughter. Um, when there's, when there's kids starving in Africa, how can you spend this money on a feast? You know, thing, things like this. Um, and it, this book takes what's in Ecclesiastes and, and kind of the deepest, darkest um, observations of the vanity and cycles of the world and says, you know what, you know what the, you know what Solomon says? He says, be merry, be joyful. Um, and that's, that's really good. I think Pastor Wilson has lived that out in his life. He exemplifies, he exemplifies this. And so I think he's, he's really kind of speaking from experience and also bringing out what the Bible is saying there. So that was, that was number seven. Number six, Reformed Catholicity, The Promise of Retrieval for Theology and Biblical Interpretation by uh, Michael Allen and Scott Swain. This is, um, it's a, more of a scholarly book, so it's good for eggheads who are kind of, um, I guess, in the Reformed world, I, I think I've come into more, I guess, I don't know what you would call it, I don't like to use the word serious, but more kind of intellectual types of 
uh, uh, Christianity through the Reformed world, and um, I, I don't know if I would actually consider myself Reformed. I guess I would consider myself Reformed on Mondays and Wednesdays, um, but uh, I find that most, not most, I find that there are strands of the Reformed world which are highly tribalistic, and um, I mean, in some ways, they're like Roman Catholics, where they, they are the one true church. And anybody who doesn't adhere to their specific formulations of justification or sovereignty are denying the gospel or something ridiculous to that. I find those groups to be really obnoxious and lacking in the spirit. Uh, I, I, I'm not saying that as a polemic. I really do believe that they are lacking the Holy Spirit. Um, I grew up in a Pentecostal environment, and I still, I say, I basically think fundamentally that's what I am. I am a Pentecostal, and I think that Pentecostals have an inherent Catholicity to them. And I think that that's because they're open to the spirit um, and they see the Holy Spirit working in lots of groups. So this is a good book for not only reformed people, but intellect, very highly intellectually inclined reformed people that kind of drills down to that Catholic water table that's in that, that does exist in the reformed world. And at that I can give two thumbs up to it, that, um, there is a kind of more Catholic spirit in the reformed world that this book does a good job of, of capturing. So I'm just going to read a, a, a fairly lengthy quote um, uh, from this book and, um, yeah, kind of give you a taste a little bit of, of what's going on in there. This is towards the end of the book. In the 16th and 17th centuries, Reformed theologians self-consciously regarded themselves as Catholic. They claimed church fathers such as Augustine as their own, Moreover, they saw themselves belonging to the tradition of the great early ecumenical creeds. The Belgic Confession gives a superb example of this. Its doctrine of God, the Trinity, and Christ draws deeply upon patristic theology and early ecumenical statements of doctrine. In its significant attention to the sacraments, prayer, and worship, it continues the broadly Catholic concern of making these practices central to the Christian identity, even as it revises aspects of Roman Catholic doctrine on these points. But the Belgic as also clear, is also clear about its Protestant identity on salvation, scripture, the sacraments, and related topics. It is unmistakably Protestant. This pattern of drawing upon patristic along with medieval theologians while making fruitful use of the history of biblical exegesis continued to be a strong pattern in the Reformed tradition for centuries. Thus, it is not surprising that Reformed scholastics continue to develop Catholic instincts in their work. For example, William Perkins titled one of his works a Reformed Catholic, and movements such as the Dutch Second Reformation drew deeply upon medieval theologians such as Bernard of Clairvaux. It should not surprise us that in the 19th century, it was a scholar in the German reform tradition, Philip Schaff, who undertook the massive project of first editing and publishing an English translation of the Antonicene, Nicene, and post-Nicene Church Fathers. Schaff's colleague at Mercersburg Seminary, John Williamson Nevin, shared an interest in both the Church Fathers and reappraisal of Calvin and Reformed Confessions. This led Nevin to propose a deeply Catholic and yet distinctively Reformed theology. Of the Incarnation and the Lord's Supper that shaped his theology of the church. It should not surprise us that at the turn of the 20th century, a central figure in Dutch Reformed theology, Hermann Bovink, drew deeply upon the church fathers and medieval doctors in his four volume Reformed Dogmatics. In critical yet appreciative appropriation, also in the Dutch Reformed tradition, a central advocate of mid 20th century Reformed liturgical renewal was a Mercersburg scholar, Howard Hageman who speaks of the Reformed tradition as the Catholic Church Reformed. Indeed, as Hageman argues, the Reformed tradition does not claim to restore a church that had eclipsed, but to reform the historic Catholic Church, for even the very name Reformed implies continuity. A tree which is Reformed is not cut down, it is pruned. Just so with our church, one with the historic Church of Jesus Christ, it has been purified and restored by the keenest of all instruments, the living Word of God. And so a lot of the guys that he's talking about there influenced uh, a lot of the guys that I studied under at seminary, M maybe not, not hugely, but Herman Bovink and um, uh, a lot of the Mercersburg guys. And the Mercersburg guys specifically, like Nevin and Schaff, influenced uh, James Jordan and Lightheart. I didn't study under them at seminary, but I came into contact with their work through that realm and... Um, 
and they've in, they've kind of exemplified this Reformed Catholic approach. Even Peter Lightheart in his End of Protestantism talks about uh, the future of Protestant, Protestantism as being a Reformed Catholic kind of thing. So um, there's another part in the book that talks about it talks about the the reform the Catholic the Church Catholic not having to do away with these distinctives like at, like um, Pentecostals or Reformed or uh, Methodist. They don't have to actually totally abandon their distinctives. We may never abandon them, but what they encourage is that each of these different traditions are like spots on on top of the earth and that each of them can drill down to this Catholic water table that connects everybody. And uh, I really like that idea um, in, in trying to kind of uh, articulate where I, where I am at in Chris's, uh, Christendom. I would say I'm probably a, a Pentecostal that is drilled down to that Catholic water table. Um, and so we have that water table in common with all of these other tribes or traditions. So that was, uh, that was number six. Number five is, uh, evangelical, sacramental, and Pentecostal, why the church should be all three by Gordon Smith. And, um, this is, it's a smaller book. It's, it doesn't take very long to read. And I'm a huge fan of this expression of Christianity. It's what I, I think just naturally kind of fall in and have, have naturally been convicted of. Uh, I don't, find myself drawn to being distinctively reformed or distinctively Lutheran or, or even distinctively Anglican, although that, that um, would probably be the closest expression. But this, it, but even within that, there's Anglicans that really despise this kind of uh, threefold approach, this, this uh, sometimes what's called a three streams aspect of, of uh, Christianity. And so I like to talk about it in those terms. Um, kind of almost out of respect for, for the Anglican tradition, and I guess Anglicanism as established was not these things. A Anglicanism as established was reformed. I mean, it's just there's no, no denying that. And then it slowly started to change with the Caroline Divines, and then which had a more Arminian bent and, and more of a ritualistic bent, and then really, really started to change with the Oxford movement in the, in the um, 18th century or the 19th century, and that, and they won out, the Oxford movement won out, and so these reformed Anglicans that exist now, I think are, I mean, uh, they, they are fighting somewhat of a losing battle, but at the same time, they're right about, about what Anglicanism used to be. However, the place where this has found a home, this kind of evangelical, sacramental, and Pentecostal has been in, in mainly in the ACNA, um, but I still have yet found a book that's like really, really good that I can enthusiastically uh, uh, endorse. And this this is okay. It's a basic treatment. I, I I would I would recommend it if somebody's like, what are you talking about with that? But yeah, check check Gordon Smith's book out. Um, but I'm still hoping for something better to come along. Um, he says this. I'll just kind of read a few a few um, passages here to give you a feel. And I think this is this is all. Th these are this is some good stuff. Without active participation in the Spirit's presence, the liturgy of the Word becomes mere intellectualism. The liturgy of the sacrament becomes mere ritualism. So this emphasis upon upon the Spirit in a more Catholic approach and in a more Protestant approach. And he says this, we are not truly Pentecostal, in other words, unless we are sacramental, and we are not truly a people who live in the fullness of the Spirit if we are not a people who live by and are feeding on the Word. So again, you have the Spirit, you have the sacrament, uh, and you have uh, the Scriptures. Without Word and sacrament, charismatic worship descends to mere sentimentality. I think we've all seen that. Um, I think that's why a lot of people leave a lot of people leave the charismatic realm because it just descends into this, this squishy sentimentality. And I'm right there with you. I don't want to be part of that. So it descends to mere sentimentality focused on human felt need as often as not emotional need. Thus, we should have a concern with what might be called the Pente Pentecostalization of evangelical worship events, the grand stage, the manipulation of emotion, the removal of the table, with the implied downplaying of the sacraments, the removal of the pulpit, 
replaced by the lectern at best and the chair by the cafe bistro table at worst for the pastor's friendly chat. So that the visual centerpiece of worship is not the table or the pulpit, but the drum set. And I would even, I would even, I have no problem with calling it an altar. I think that having the altar as the centerpiece of worship, someone comes in and sees that, automatically says sacrifice. Um, that's, that's a huge thing that I think evangelicals or charismatics have lost. Um, and so he's pointing out here that the centerpiece of these kind of worships is the drum set, which is, I think, which is funny and true. Yes, all Christian communities surely need to know the very thing that the mystical Pentecostal tradition has consistently affirmed, the immediacy of the spirit in the life of the Christian and the life of the church, but it is not at the expense of either the authority of the word and of preaching or the vital and defining place of the sacrament. Rather, it is necessarily the case that the experience of the spirit is both the complement to and the very means by which the word and sacrament are present to the church. And yet, so he, so he says, we need the spirit basically complementing these things. And he says, and yet having in, uh, stressed the importance and priority of both word and sacrament, so uh, reformed people being really good at the word, Catholics, Anglicans being really good at the sacrament, uh, and Pentecostals being good at the spirit. He's, he's affirming both word and sacrament. He says we can still, and then he starts pushing against more of the word and sacrament crowd, we can still and we must affirm that there is a witness in the New Testament to something without doubt experienced often in the life of the church that we can and must speak of as unmediated grace. And I've heard some people say that there is no such thing as unmediated grace. Grace always comes through mediation, whether it's word or whether it's sacrament or whether it's creation, whatever. Um, but I think the Pentecostal rightly realizes there is something of a direct connection with the Holy Spirit in certain phenomenological instances. We can and need to speak of the immediate gift of the Spirit to the Christian and to the church, a gift that is experienced as divine grace, empowerment, illumination, and comfort. Our experience of the Spirit is not something in the background, but rather a dynamic experience of God's grace that informs. Well, a better word is animates the life of the Christian and the life of the church. It's a pretty simple idea. It's just affirming the strengths of all three of these approaches. Um, and also a word about having the altar. Not all sacrifice has to do with atonement. So there's sacrifices of praise, there's sacrifices of thanksgiving that we can give. Um, and so that's what I mean when I'm okay with calling it an altar. I'm not suggesting that Christ is re-sacrificed anew um, during um, the celebration of the Lord's Supper. And also neither does Rome. Um, Rome has repudiated that late medieval era. And so I think on that issue, I think they're perfectly orthodox. Um, but uh, so yeah, so that was that was number five. I think that that is a really, um, uh, I think it's the future of, of Christianity, really. Um, the Pentecostal realm is hugely dominant in the global south. And it is just a phenomenon that I think um, uh, it's just in, it's undeniable in, in the sense of, of, of its of its movement universally in the church. And uh, you really we really got to take it seriously and figure out how to incorporate it into a, a biblical and sacramental expression, I think. OK, so number four, Flannery O'Connor, a good man is hard to find and other stories. Um, I think O'Connor, she lived in the South in the early 20th century, maybe, maybe, maybe the mid 20th century, I'm not sure, 40s, something like this. Um, and she was a Roman Catholic, and I think her work can be better appreciated if you, um, if you know, if you read her personal letters, um, which I can't remember, those are available, but if you read her personal correspondence, you see that she is a, uh, um, she's a devout Christian. She's very, very, there's a, there's kind of just a basic Christianity that she espouses. And I think she's genu genuine in that. And, um, she was, a, she is a Roman Catholic, but she's living in the deep South. And that's where a lot of her short stories take place. And, um, so even though she has this Roman Catholic bent, um, there is, uh, um, I think she read the Summa every night, um, 
there is this kind of stout Protestant theology in her in her works, this kind of grace uh, that's that's undeserved um, that kind of strips away all of our anything anything that kind of supplements boasting or pride um, in who we are in our in our virtues. She does a really good job of kind of squashing that, and I think that uh, that's a particularly Protestant Protestant thing. But um, she's an excellent writer, excellent wordsmith. There's a certain kind of violence to her work that's not gratuitous, but sometimes it is uh, daunting. It, it can kind of kind of in the same way when you're reading Lewis, uh, like in Paralandra, and all of a sudden. Uh, Ransom starts fighting the devil figure <laughs> and he's like like his jaws like falling off or like in that hideous strength when all the animals come through and stampede um, there's a certain kind of violence there and and O'Connor has these in some of her stories um, but they're they're pretty good um, they're kind of like Old Testament stories that are more bizarre and kind of hard to extract meaning out of um, that's what that she makes you work for. And some of them, it's like, man, I really see what she's doing here with others. Others, I, I'm like, I'm not really quite sure what, what she's doing. It's almost, it's like, I wish I could talk to her be like, what is, what's going on here? Um, but there, there, there's some gems in there. Um, in that collection, I really liked A Good Man is Hard to Find and uh, Good Country People. Those are my favorite uh, from there. In um, uh, Good Country People, you have this, you have this, woman who she's this intellectual atheist and she gets basically um conned by a guy who's a more consistent atheist who's been an atheist all of his life um and just the way she he she o'connor is basically showing us what kind of consistent un, undefiled atheism is and it catches this kind of intellectual atheist who's only doing it really kind of out of rebellion what that looks like um, so I thought that was pretty good. A Good Man is Hard to Find. That's one of her more famous ones. She has this line at the end. Um, there's so many good things in that. I can't, I'm not, I'm not going to spend a whole, a whole bunch of time on it, but there's this famous line at the end where it said, uh, she would have been a good woman, the misfit said, if it had been somebody there to shoot her every minute of her life. <laughs> and it's, it's talking about this, like really this, he's talking about this grandmother who's really religious and but she has a lot of pride and, and um, uh, once, once her life is on the line, then she kind of starts changing her tune a little bit and uh, then the humility starts coming. And so, um, yeah, there's just, there's really good stuff, really good stuff there. Uh, number three, everything that rises must converge. Uh, these are stories from Flannery O'Connor again. Um, I'll just read a, 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 a quote from the introduction of that book. Um, Christ the Tiger, a phrase in Eliot, is a force felt in O'Connor. In her work, we are shown that vices are fathered by our heroism, virtues forced upon us by our impudent crimes, and that neither fear nor courage saves us. If we are, sa we are saved by grace, if at all, though courage may dispose us toward grace. Um, the Enduring Chill and The Lame Shall Enter First were my favorites in, in this collection. The Enduring Chill... Again, it has this kind of um, really arrogant atheist character, and he gets sick, and he and he has this priest come in. I'm recall I read these a long time. I read them last summer, um, but he has this priest come in because he he just simply wants to talk about ideas. He wants to talk about authors that he's read, and he's kind of hoping. And he specifically asked for the I think he specifically asked for the Roman Catholic priest because he doesn't think that the, the Methodist on the street is gonna be educated. And the Roman Catholic priest comes in and he just basically starts responding to him with these dogmas. Um, uh, you know, do you believe in Jesus? Have you, have you repented of your sins? Um, and the guy is, he's, uh, he's, he's really annoyed that he's asking him these questions. He's like, well, I wanna talk about James Joyce and, and all of these things and uh, the priest, he just kind of, he just kind of leaves and he's like he's like he's a good kid at heart but he's really stupid <laughs> basically and this kid just fa he's this he's i think he's back from you know he's back from new york or harvard or something and um you know he's back in his small town and he he just despises the uh, uh the sim simplicity of where he came from and 
um, the the priest uh, kind of puts him in his place. So that that's a that's one of my favorite scenes in that um, story. And then the lame shall enter first is that's an incredible uh, that's an incredible story. Has um, uh, it has another atheist <laughs> guy um, who is a social worker and he's he wants to take care of people. I mean, it's just a classic example of of really. I mean, you read this guy and it's like, man, there's this is. You know, this is what so many people think of. I'm a good person. I help people. And that's what this guy is. He's he's he is he is decidedly anti-Christian, but he's a good person because he works as a social worker. And he's going to help this 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 kid who has this handicap, and he's a little bit rebellious. And I'm going to help him out. But this kid who's rebellious, he starts taking up reading the Bible, and like he's in his home, and he starts like eating pages of the Bible, like Ezekiel. Uh, and I mean, he starts, he starts doing it as an act of rebellion to this guy and, and starts telling him that this guy's going to go to hell. And, um, and so that's a, that's a really, um, that's a really good one that I like. There's a lot of really good stuff there. Um, okay. Number two is the Catholic religion, a manual of instruction for members of the Anglican church by Vernon Staley. Um, I've, I've been interested in Anglicanism for a few years now, and uh, so I've kind of wanted to understand the Catholic wing of Anglicanism. Uh, and as I said before, this really did not come about until the, the 19th century. Prior to that, it wasn't Catholic. It, it did not have these really overt Catholic ideas in it. And um, uh, Vernon Staley's book, is more in the Anglo-Catholic realm. I do have a soft spot for the the Anglo-Catholic realm um, because they there is something commendatory about tradition in in, in a sense of uh, uh, just kind of preserving the old things, and um, I do I do like that. And there is a there is a simplicity to what he goes through in here, and um, seems like a sincerity and the. There was an Anglo-Catholic church on the corner, whatever the Episcopal church is, on the corner of Broadway and Wall Street in 1902 or 1913. Um, they, because they were dedicated to kind of just traditional Catholic beliefs, they didn't, they weren't going to marry anybody who was divorced. I mean, that was the 20th century, early 20th century. So obviously, I, I've, I've. Uh, I have found that the divorce remarriage issue is, is a huge issue. And so anybody who is, who is guarding that is going to have find a soft spot with me. However, the distinctives of Anglo Catholicism, I don't necessarily buy into. Um, but I'm, I'm still glad, uh, for, for them. They, they do offer a kind of more poetic and in, in some ways, less academic expression of Christianity, more experiential in that way. They kind of parallel kind of the evangelical enthusiasm that was happening in the 19th century of we want to get away from like arguing about confessionalism and in and, and the minutia of doctrine and we want to experience God truly. We want to know God um, in a real way and I think the the Anglo-Catholic expression of that really finds that experience through the sacraments. And I wouldn't deny that. I would say that there is an experiential, um, there is an experience of God in that. Um, it's not the only way we experience God, but it is one way that I think is downplayed in, in some churches. So anyway, that's a, that was a good, uh, that was a, a fairly good read um, as, as far as that goes. And also, yeah, the, the interesting thing is that the Anglo-Catholics, I don't know any Anglican denomination. There's not a single Anglican denomination. Oh, I, I bring up the divorce remarriage thing because because Staley, he, he mentions that in there. He mentions that they, he, he says that there is disagreement in the Church of England over this, but we hold that people can't get um, divorced and remarried. That a spouse has to die in order for a valid uh, remarriage to occur or for them to be able to get married again. And the interesting thing is, I don't know of a single Anglican denomination that holds this anymore. Um, the Church of England, I, I officially changed their position 
um, I think in 2004 or something like something like this. And then over the course of time, this is this isn't to say the, the Anglican Church uh, m more than any Protestant church since the Reformation, at least in doctrine, um, held to the just the old Catholic position on divorce and remarriage, the biblical position. Um, although over that time, this like 400 period, 400 year period, there were something around like 300 divorces granted, but it was mainly among like no nobility and, and stuff like that, which if you look in the history of Christianity, that's a problem, but that typically people who are wealthy and have power are able to get away with things because the church is just weak in that moment or whatever. Um, so, but it is interesting to me. There is one Anglo-Catholic uh, denomination called Diocese of the Holy Cross that claims to believe that you can't get remarried after divorce. But I think from what I could tell, I've talked to their archbishop, I've talked to some of their priests, and one of their priests was wanted to change that doctrine. And from what I could tell, I don't think they actually, re they don't really believe it. They kind of, from what I can tell, take a, a Roman Catholic approach where we you can figure out ways to annul it. There's there's kind of just a sophistry that goes along with ha letting it happen anyway. So anyway, a few thoughts on, on the Anglo-Catholic stuff. Okay, and number one is the vision glorious uh, themes and personalities of the Catholic revival and Anglicanism by uh, Jeffrey Roll. Rowell, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that, but that's an, it's another helpful summary of kind of the Anglo-Catholic thing that was happening. Sometimes it's called the Oxford Movement, sometimes called the Tractarians. Um, uh, but John Keeble, um, Edward Pusey, John Henry Newman, uh, Newman eventually converted to Rome, though, um, um, yeah, I, I don't, yeah, but John Keeble and Edward Pusey, I don't think they did. Um, se yeah, several of these guys stayed in, in the Anglican Church. Um, as I said before, I want to consider myself Anglo-Catholic, but I do appreciate um, a lot of what these guys were doing. Um, they, a lot of them really had a I mean, I had a concern for holiness. Uh, one of Hen John Henry Newman's sermons is Without Holiness, No One Will See the Lord, talking about the necessity for holiness in the Christian life. And they exemplified that. I think that gave power to their preaching. Um, and when the Church of England was really kind of dying in a lot of ways, the, the Reformed tradition in the Church of England just became this academic exercise. So that's on you guys. Um, if you're going to tell the Holy Spirit to leave, don't be surprised when someone with more Catholic pro proclivities comes along and the Holy Spirit uses them instead. Um, I just say that because I, the, I, there's a lot of really angry Reformed Anglicans about this movement, but I'm very sympathetic to the movement because of those reasons. Um, also, the Anglo-Catholic movement it tends to be more poetic and, and mysterious. A lot of them were influenced by the Eastern, um, Eastern theologians, um, and so there's, there's a bit more mystery there as opposed to kind of a hyper-rationalism or just an overemphasis on rationalism, which tends to be more in the reformed stream, which is both a, a, uh, a strength and a weakness. I mean, the, the ref reformed stream in Protestantism is just, I, I would say the Protestant version of the medieval scholastics. Um, and we, we don't debate the number of angels on the 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 tip of a pin, um, but we debate how to precisely uh, um, dissect how justification happens in a man, and it just becomes dead. And and um, and there's a certain kind of because the spirit has kind of left. We think that if we just continue preaching justification by faith alone, that we're gonna recover something and. It's just not the problems. We're, we're, we're not living in a world where people are walking around like semi-Pelagians or Pelagians thinking if they just work hard enough, they're going to get to heaven. Um, it's just not, it's not the world we live in anymore. And so uh, we th we're thankful for what happened in the Protestant uh, Reformation, but um, <laughs> you, got, you have to be in tune to what's going on in the world and you have to be super open to the Holy Spirit in order to see um, what's going on. And I think the Oxford movement was. I think that they erred a lot. I don't think the answer is in apostolic succession or whatever. Um, but there is a certain kind of 
exaltation in mystery and the poetic, um, which I think is a corrective to the over-rationalization that, that was happening in Protestantism, the deadness of those churches, the nominalism. Um, the, the Oxford movement shares the same kind of concerns that the evangelicals, the evangelical movement in the church at the time had. We don't want nominal Christians. We want true Christians. We want Christians who fast and pray and suffer <laughs> for the faith. And so I think these guys were, were doing a lot of that. Um, a lot, there was a lot of missionary work to the, the, uh, the, the slums in London. There was a lot of missionary work overseas. Um, and so, uh, yeah, a lot of that stuff. Newman said in one of his lectures, the heart is commonly reached not by reason, but by imagination. Um, and this reminds me of Chesterton. And I've heard that Chesterton was, is, was channeling Newman in a lot of his writing. So I've liked Chesterton for a long time. He's meant a great deal to me. Um, several years ago when I read him, it was incredible relief to read uh, orthodoxy and Newman has the same kind of thing going on with him so it, it, it creates the soft spot in my heart for for these guys um, and so I can understand why a lot of people go to Rome um, you know with these guys because um, I like them I like them a lot too but you know as I, I have another series of, of why I'm not going to go to Rome um, but I can understand why people do um, I'll just read a few passages from, from the book here. The genius of the Oxford movement and the secret of its influence was in its rediscovery of the wholeness of patristic theology, of the reality of sacramental grace, and a refusal similar to that of Kierkegaard to confine theology to the domain of the speculative. By speculative, they mean just like abstract, academic abstractions. The great mystery of transforming grace, of the divine indwelling and participation in the divine nature, which Pusey saw as central to the life of the church in the first four centuries, he made central to his own teaching. This was made real and not nom this is this was what made real and not nominal Christians. This distinguished a living theology rooted in worship from rationalist academic speculation. The scholar must advance in holiness, and that, in the end, was what made Pusey attractive and drew the streams of penitence to his lodgings in Christchurch. So, yeah, that's, that's Pusey. Um, something about Newman's sermons here. The first note that sounded in Newman's sermons was a call to holiness. The severe demands of Christian living, holiness is necessary for future blessedness, and heaven would be hell for an irreligious man. Um, John Keeble on the rationalism, uh, or on rationalism in the Eucharist. Um, this I would affirm wholeheartedly. Uh, transubstantiation on the one hand, the denial of Christ's real presence on the other, the two errors in the original are perhaps but rationalism in two different forms. Endeavors to explain away and bring nearer to the human intellect that which had been left thoroughly mysterious both by scripture and tradition. They would turn the attention of man from the real life-giving miracle to mere metaphysical or grammatical subtleties, such as our fathers never knew. <laughs> yeah. Um, another... another uh, Thing from Keeble here. Christian, oh, this is from Keeble's commonplace book. Christianity is not a matter of logical argument arrangements or philosophical investigation, much less of rhetorical skill. Not that these things are useless as talents, but then it should always be remembered that they are only talents and will accordingly prove worse than useless, except they be united with rare humility. The quest for truth, the and then then the author goes, so that was from Keeble's Commonplace, and then the author goes on. The quest for truth, the critical questions were for Keeble always to be conjoined with the search for the good, the quest for holiness, and he was well aware that intellectual pride could be an insuperable barrier to that quest. Faith was a total response of man's being, not to be reduced to intellectual assent, and faith was evoked not by strident slogans, but sprang from a heart moved to love by the love of God. So that kind of gives you a little taste of uh, what these guys were doing, who they were. Um, but I, I, I particularly enjoyed reading that book. Some honorable mentions. I just, I would have included the, this in the list, um, but I didn't have it with me because I had loaned it to somebody. But it's uh, Get Married and Save the World by 
uh, Ordinary Brother or Thomas Ackerman. What's the, A Guide to Christian Marriage, The Witness of the Family and Restoring the World. Very long, uh, 360 pages or so. Um, but, I mean, the font is big, and um, uh, but it's a good book. I, I, w- I would have been up there maybe as number one. Um, it's, uh, I would affirm probably about 95% of everything in here. Uh, th- this is, this is a, a guy who is in tune with the needs of the era, of, of our time. This is, um, these kinds of books are way more important than books on, uh, you know, baptism or the Eucharist, how we understand these things, um, or divine simplicity, whatever abstraction uh, people are writing about. Those things are good and they're useful, but the the problem of the day, this is this is a this is a prophetic book um, in the sense of that I, I think this this guy is in tune with what the Holy Spirit is saying. Um, he is uh, 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 he is affirming that divorce and remarriage is adultery. It's just something simply said straightforward by our Lord and uh, ignored by most of the church today. Straight up ignored and transgressed regularly. And then we have we we don't have people speaking against it. And so like uh, like William uh, Burke said, uh, Edmund Burke, the, the old, I mean, if he said this, the only thing for evil to pre- prevail is for good men to do nothing. So you can keep doing nothing um, and we can keep losing our culture, losing the land because we're continuing to allow these covenant breakers uh, and these priests and pastors to permit this covenant breaking. It's not an insignificant issue. It's it's fundamental. Um, Henry Van Til in a Calvinistic conception of culture. He said that uh, the family is the fount of culture, and if you dilute that, you dilute everything else. Everything else becomes dust and ashes. I wouldn't necessarily totally put it that way, but if you dilute obedience to God in certain kind of institutional forms, like the family, family being the smallest form of government, um, you're going to dilute everything else, and that's exactly what we're seeing. So anyway, Get Married and Save the World has one chapter dedicated to that, and the rest is roles of of the wife, roles of the husband, um, other things about um, sexuality, um, and it's all pretty good. I would generally agree with it. The main thing that I would not agree with is uh, he has kind of an Anabaptist bent on, um, like, women can't wear makeup and stuff. Which I don't think the I don't think the Bible teaches, but I can understand why why someone would hold to that. Um, but so that's kind of just one minor disagreement. But beyond that, I would agree, and 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 also the essence, the impetus behind that, I would agree with. I would agree with modesty. Uh, I just think it's more artful than than a kind of teetotal approach to uh, to makeup or whatever. But it's a really good, really good book. If you're thinking of getting married, it would be something that I would recommend. Um, so those uh, those are the books that uh, I, I read last year. And um, so hopefully that was helpful. That's all I got for you. Have a good one. Bye.